Welcome back to the final round here on Yahoo Finance. Miles Udlin with you in New York. Well, we've seen a couple of solid months for uh, the U.S. labor market, but we're still down some 11 million jobs from where we were in February. So what does the future of the labor market look like and, and how are companies going to get workers back in the office? Will they get workers back in the office? And where is uh, kind of the executive's head at right now? For more uh, on this, we're joined uh, by John Chuang. He is the CEO and founder of Aquent, a staffing agency based out of Boston. John, thanks so much uh, for joining the show. So I guess let's just kind of start with um, your view right now on, on how companies, how your clients are thinking about their staffing levels and, and kind of how they want to proceed from here. Everyone went home in the spring, kind of no plan on the other side. What's it looking like six months later? Yeah, the, the key here, we've, you know, the amazing, the one word that I would use to, to talk about the change in, in work over the last six months is break, breathtaking. I mean, we've seen incredible change that one would expect over a generation compacted into six months. And the answer to the question is, I think there are a lot of companies and a lot of CEOs of companies that I'm not sure want to see workers uh, back at work. We've had enormous uh, change in all sorts of companies. So let's, let's break it down a little bit. If you look at the big tech companies, the Amazons of the world, the Facebooks of the world, the Googles of the world, they went from around 15% remote work to now they're around 100% work uh, of remote work. And if you look at that 100%, 70% is anywhere, anywhere, 30% is local, but work for home. But that indicates like where their heads might be in terms of the future. Now, if you looked at small and medium business, where the majority of Americans work in the country today, that's also had phenomenal changes, where work was more maybe 27% work from home before the pandemic. Now it's over 50% at 57%. The laggard in, in working from home is really large companies, not tech. You know, but even that has doubled from 20% to 40%. So you've seen just huge changes in how companies view um, where their people should work. And right now, um, there are a lot of companies that are indicating that, wow, we've tried remote work for the last six months and it feels really good. We're gonna stay that way. I think we're gonna have a really, really big impacts um, along the way from remote work. John, Dan Roberts here. I know that you're very bullish on the remote work, and I know that in our, our note from you guys, you mentioned that you are closing or planning to close a number of your own offices for Aquint. And I guess I would just ask you if there's any danger right now in people overestimating the uh, work from home permanence. You know, it sounds like you think there will be a growth in work from home still before it, I guess, uh, peaks. But you wonder uh, if people are kind of getting too excited, thinking, well, this is it. I'm never going into an office again. And of course, already now here in the fall, a number of companies that we've discussed, uh, of course, it's a minority, but they are already beginning in waves to bring people back. So you just wonder if there could be a number of people who are in for a rude awakening come, I don't know, February, March, when suddenly their company says, OK, we think it's safe and we'd like you to come back to the office now. Right. Yeah. No, I don't think I don't think that's the danger because a company could always go back to the the old ways. I think the danger is missing the opportunity of new ways of working. So the danger is not embracing remote work, not embracing where we think the future of for for a lot of people are, are going to be, because the downsides are really easy. The downsides. Yeah, you could always get the office space again. You know, rents are plummeting, especially office space in cities. So if you take a break and, and try remote work and if it doesn't work, you could always pick up office space and return to normal for a lot for a lot less. But I think the impacts of remote work are really tremendous um, and they're going to show up in two areas. One area is just more labor liquidity. In the United States, we're not really one labor market. We're really hundreds of local labor markets, right? I mean, if you're working in Philadelphia, you're really going to get a job in San Diego, you know, maybe, but probably not. But today that is changing. Today, you know, there's much more liquidity of labor markets. And you, if you live one place, you could work another place. It's really about time zone work now, not location work. And there are only three time zones in the United States. So it's kind of easy. The second part, though, is the equality of pay rates. In the United States, you used to have, um, and you still do, all right, but, but you could feel the change. You used to have certain labor markets where labor rates are a lot more expensive, San Francisco and New York. Then you have other cities, smaller cities, rural areas, where labor, where labor rates are lower. What you begin to see now is a convergence of, of labor rates where companies that would never before think of recruiting and hiring people in small cities or in rural areas, they're going full recruiting people. 
and hiring people, and you see wages going up in those months. And likewise, your city, you know, it might be harder to command that really big rate now because now you're competing against a lot of qualified people from all across the United States with lo lower costs. So you're seeing changes uh, because of this, all compressed in six months. John, uh, so great to see you again. I, I want to get your thoughts on the, the Department of Labor today announcing that proposed rule that would possibly define by way of a test whether workers are actually employees or independent contractors. Uh, it was about a month ago, right, that Uber and Lyft were in the 11th hour able to strike a deal and continue operations here in California. How do you anticipate this DOL potential rule uh, really changing the game here? I know you have some choice thoughts on how a lot of these Uber and Lyft drivers have been classified in the past. Yes, yeah, no, I continue to believe that the best way um, to, to, to solve the problems um, of, that we're having uh, with, with inequality in America and with the fact that you have a lot of independent um, workers and independent professor, professionals who do not have um, the benefit of our social security net. They do not have unemployment. They do not have workers comp. Uh, they're not covered by FICA or social security. They do not have uh, health care. And one way can do it is to create this kind of third way, this, 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 you know, in between not as good as employee way, which I don't think makes any sense. I think the laws are extremely clear and they should be, you know, one way or the other. You're either an employee or you're a, a um, independent professional. And if you're an employee, you're covered by certain minimum standards and minimum wages that we've had uh, in our country for really over a hundred years. And I think those have served our country really well and they should continue to be served. So I'm all for, um, you know, you know, having a sharp distinction uh, between whether you're an employee or an independent contractor, but not some very confusing middle way, which is really a way for a whole bunch of companies, a narrow set of companies, actually gig economy workers, to get by with not paying as many taxes as everyone else. As everyone else. I think it's unfair. All right. Uh, John Fong is the CEO and founder of Aquent. Uh, John, thanks so much for joining the program. Really great to get your thoughts. Great. Thank you.